go. Okay. So welcome to Monarch Staffing's first 2021 webinar panel discussion on Change, Adapt, and Thrive. I am Laura Casper, the owner of Monarch Staffing and your host today. And Monarch Staffing is a staffing, training, and HR consulting firm in the Philadelphia region. We've placed over 10,000 employees, and this year we're celebrating our 20th year anniversary. And we wanted to do something special and share all the great stories that, uh, that businesses that are doing so well with changing, adapting, and thriving in today's turbulent climate. We all know this past year has really thrown us curveballs between the COVID pandemic, the social unrest, and the presidential election. We want this to be an interactive webinar. So if you can use the chat button now and just share with us maybe one thing that you hope to learn from this session, we will cover it. Um, we'll also have time at the end for the panel questions. And just a reminder, if you can keep yourself on mute during the session, that would be great. And, you know, I understand this is your lunchtime. So if you want to grab your lunch, have your drinks, you know, no judgment here. So whatever you, you want to do there, that would be great. Um, I'm excited to introduce our amazing panel and have them share with you how their businesses and themselves have embraced change over the past year and share their experiences in navigating uncertainty. So first we have Diane Hart, who is the Global Chief Human Resource Officer with IPS, Integrated Project Service, an LLC where she has oversight of the global human resource function spanning across 10 countries that include talent acquisition, talent leadership and development, organizational design. And prior to joining IPS, she served as the Senior Global Director of Human Resources for a $9 billion global chemical company. Diane brings diverse experience in the field of human resources, talent acquisition, and her specific areas of expertise include leadership formation, organizational turnaround, workforce planning, and enterprise transformation. Diane, welcome. Next, we have Dana Kaiser, who is the Vice President and HR Business Partner with Radiant Group. Dana oversees talent planning, organizational development, talent management, and serves as the strategic business partner and human resource consultant for Radiant's diversified mortgage and real estate business. She's also a leader in the company's inclusion and diversity efforts. And prior to joining Radiant, she led the HR department at Tryon Group and served in the HR management and talent acquisition roles for IBC. Dana, welcome. Thanks and for having me. A, yep, yep. Next, we have a Pam Steflow, who is the founder of PS Squared, a talent strategist and certified Clifton Strength Coach. Throughout Pam's career, she served as the VP of Talent Development at a healthcare startup and spent 18 years at SAP, leading a variety of talent and leadership development functions before creating PS Squared Advisors, a small boutique consulting firm helping organizations design and implement holistic talent strategies. Welcome, Pam. Nice to be with everybody yeah. today. Yeah, ladies, nice to have you. So, but before we jump in, I'm going to ask Diane first and then Dana to kind of just give us a brief update on their current state and with their employers. So this way you can kind of have a perspective from them on where they are coming from. And Pam is our consultant on the panel. And later you'll hear from Pam and what she is seeing with her clients. So Diane, we will turn it over to you first. Sure. Thank you so much for that warm yeah. welcome, Laura. And hello, everyone. Good morning. Soon to be afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, my company, IPS, is a AEC firm. It it's, stands for Architecture, Engineering, and Consult, uh, Construction Consulting Firm. And what we do, with the, in, and we focus on life sciences. Our life sciences uh, focus is primarily pharma. Um, we build, we design, we, uh, we validate pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities in order to get their product to market. So what we've learned, and unfortunately in this, this crisis, what we've learned is we're, we've actually thrived. Um, our business is, is booming better and, and greater and bigger than ever, um, but it's extremely fast paced. So that face, fast pace internally translates into how we serve our, our customers, our clients as well. So what we, what we pride ourselves in is what we're doing is helping those clients Play, we're playing a part, a small part, um, but a part in saving and improving lives across this COVID crisis. So getting their product, um, which is in this case, a lot of our projects are around the COVID vaccine vaccination and getting that out the door through their manufacturing cycle 
and out the door and distributed to, um, to, to the, of course, the patient population. So that feels really good to us and, 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 uh, and our employees. So a couple of things though we've discovered along the way though is around several innovative ways that we've been able to discover that we would not normally discover without this COVID crisis. And that's further finding ways to be efficient and to be fast because typically the, the ramp up time to commercialization could be anywhere from 12 to, uh, to one year to three years um, potentially. And we were able to get things out the door within six to eight months. Um, helping them design and get things out faster and better than ever before. So cleanliness is also a big part of, of what we do and making sure that that uh, is in place for them. And some of the innovative things that we've done is created um, module types of offering, service offerings to them, structures to be able to put into a particular facility and pull right back out and go to another facility if they needed to, to help with that fast um, pace to get to market. Diane, let me just interrupt for a minute. Now, how's the state? Like, is everybody hybrid in office, everybody remote? You have a global organization. Can you share with us where people are and how, what that looks like? Yes, yes. We're, uh, I'd say 80 to 90% remote. Wow. Uh, we do have a population, a 10 to 20% population that is at the client site. Mm. But we've been able to mitigate out of the three divisions that we have, two of the divisions don't necessarily have to be at the client. Uh, I say I'd say one and a half. Um, one of the divisions, more than half of their their population does uh, because they're validating the physical equipment at the facilities. And then our construction um, division primarily is on site. So we have lots of moving parts and paying close attention to where people are and what they're doing. Okay, that's great. I'm going to ask Dana just to give us a quick update on like her status and what the company looks like in your locations and where they are just so we can kind of see that you know it's 2021 a lot has changed over the past year right it definitely has yeah. this has definitely been the year of change yeah um whether we were ready for it or not yeah. um so radiant group is a mortgage insurance and real estate services company um, so anyone that's ever needed um when they got a mortgage and needed pmi as part of their mortgage um we sell PMI to banks. So we're primarily a B2B company. Um, and our, our biggest customers are Wells Fargo, US Bank, Bank of America, you know, large, large uh, financial institutions. Um, so we have about 1600 employees um, stretched across the US. So we are a US company. Um, and we have our primary um, office is in Philadelphia. So our headquarters is based in Philadelphia where about half of our employees are based. And then we have some other satellite offices in Pittsburgh, um, one in Tampa, Denver, Salt Lake City, um, and a small office outside of Dallas. Um, so our employees are pretty dispersed and we had about probably 400 to 500 remote employees prior to the pandemic. Hmm. Um, so when March hit, everyone, we kind of flipped a switch and everyone went fully remote almost overnight, um, as did I'm sure most of you <laughs> with, with your workforce. Um, and we've been that way since March. Um, hmm. I'm thankful to work for an organization and our CEO and leadership team have kept employee safety as the number one driving force in decisions around our offices. And thankfully, similar to, um, to Diane, is that our company is, is thriving right now. Um, mortgage rates are at an all-time low. Lots of people are refinancing. While the housing market was on pause for a while where people couldn't actually go in and, and view homes, that has picked up since lockdown has, has um, uh, restrictions have loosened. Um, so we've been extremely busy, um, which is a good thing. Um, and we've been able to shift to remote work hmm. um, in a smooth way. So we, we haven't had the, the need or the force to kind of drive us back into the office. Um, so as of right now, our offices will stay closed until hmm. I think we said April would be the earliest they would reopen. Um, we have about 85 to 90 employees that need to go into the office on some level of frequency. 
um, based on their jobs. Um, you know, a lot of our title operations still have some manual processes that we're working to try to automate, um, but we need some folks in the offices there. Um, we try to limit the number of people going into an office on any given day um, and the frequency. Um, some of our finance folks have to go in, but they only go in once a week, for example. Um, and we try to stagger that with other departments that may need to go in once a week for a specific need, that kind of thing. So that is where we are. And, okay. and we're looking ahead into the future in terms of what can we offer to employees in terms of choice and flexibility with their work, um, with their work location and their, their work environment going forward. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of jump right into our first question. And then I'm going to ask the panelists if they can kind of share, you know, just overall how the pandemic, um, the social unrest, you know, has played into your company's overall culture shift and change um, over the past year. And then what kind of has changed in regards to um, diversity, you know, and inclusion, and I'll have Dana take the lead and then Diane and then Pam will jump in. So can you share with us sure. about that piece? I know you also head up the diversity and inclusion um, for your company too. So I would love to hear about that as well. Yeah, well. we've, um, we were fortunate in that we have really kicked our um, inclusion and diversity efforts into high gear, <clears throat> probably in 2019. And I, I joined Radian at the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. um, so I had had some experience in the, the DNI space at, at Tryon as well as at Independence Blue Cross. So when Radian, uh, when our CEO was really driving the decision to be more intentional around our efforts with inclusion and diversity, I was, I was happy to raise my hand and, and get involved. Um, so we had actually just established an inclusion and diversity council at Radian. I think their first meeting was March 6th. So just 10 days later, everyone got forced home. Wow. Um, but it was good that we had already started taking steps. And, and like I said, being more intentional around our efforts, as opposed to just focusing on BAU, what's the right thing to do, things like that. Um, I would say the events of 2020 really allowed us and gave us an opportunity to engage our employees in a way that we may not have otherwise. Hmm. Um, we, you know, when the protests started to occur and the civil unrest regarding racial inequity happened, two of our council members came forward and said, we'd like to host an open discussion with our employees hmm. and, you know, hear from them. How are, what are their experiences? How are they reacting to this? You know, what are the things that they're trying to process? Um, and it was great. Um, so we hosted a couple of open mm. Zoom sessions. We, we sent out a couple videos for people to watch. Um, um, there's Procter and Gamble videos, one's called The Look and one's yeah. called The Talk. So if you haven't seen them, I can share the links with, with mm -hmm. Laura and we can send them out. Um, but they're really thought provoking. Um, and for me, it was, it was a video that really kind of defined white privilege. Um, and that, that's what my, what really resonated with me. Um, so they hosted these discussions. We heard a lot of different experiences from our employees, but we also got a lot of resources and ideas from those discussions. And we really found that people were excited to be part of how to make things better and how we can do better at the organization. So we, we really um, were able to capture the ideas that our employees had and engage them in that process going forward. Um, so we found that to be a really big positive um, from some not so positive events that, that occurred this year. Um, the other thing relative to the pandemic is that it really forced us to be more purposeful on our communications. And um, you kind of get stuck in such a routine and a comfort level that you kind of, you know, communicate in a certain way. And, and when everybody was forced to be remote, our CEO started sending weekly messages to all of our workforce to keep them informed with what was going on, obviously, from a pandemic standpoint, but also it, it's continued to this day. Um, so he's continued to stay connected with our employees in that way. Several of our leaders started doing virtual roundtables with employees. Um, and we, you know, having that more, fo more of an intentional focus on communication with our workforce, we found that 
even our employees that were virtual prior to the pandemic felt that they were more connected than they had been before. Um, so some, some positive outcomes from, um, from an unexpected year. Hmm. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And then Diane, do you want to add some insight to that on how your company and the culture really has changed and you know, what, what kind of also has changed around the diversity and inclusion? Sure, sure. And uh, to piggyback on a lot of what Dana has already said, we had similar experiences. But culturally, I'll start with culturally, and then I could segue into our diversity right. initiative. But the, the the cultural change, there's there's many different factors, right? We're, we're more ep empathetic. Um, I think we're more patient with one another. We found, um, and again, this is this this whole crisis has provided us an opportunity, and that's how we've embraced this. This is truly an opportunity. Or a case for change that we not normally would have been able to uh, get off the ground as, as fast, uh, as effective, and embracing every employee as possible and reaching deep into the organization. So uh, resilience is another word that comes to mind, adaptability. <laughs> We're extremely more adaptable than we ever thought we could be. Uh, being a consulting company, FaceTime was really, really important. Collaboration mm -hmm. was one of, is, is one of our core values and what we stand for, uh, knowledge, passion, um, uh, is, is everything to us. So, so that ability to collaborate all the time, to be able to figure out how to do that remotely was such a, a huge aha for the organization um, and actually put some um, peace of mind into some of the leaders because they were getting so many requests prior to COVID about this whole work from home and some hybrid mm -hmm. approach um, that, uh, that they were fairly resistant to do because mm -hmm. of that collaboration. Piece. So our ability to pivot, we found that, that, um, that we're so much more resilient that way. Um, we pride ourselves in around collaboration. So being that in-person, um, that, that in-person touch, uh, we have found it challenging though, as leaders to be able to keep that touch point going without having any type of uh, fatigue when it comes to Teams or Zoom calls all the time, right. being able to balance that relationship, but fostering that relationship through that more virtual touch point. Um, we, could, we found that at the end of the day, it's equally as important, uh, equally as effective to be able to do it virtually as in person as well. So we're, we're most likely gonna keep some type of hybrid um, uh, uh, work from home, remote work uh, type of structure. Now, in terms of diversity, um, diversity has just exploded within IPS and it's such a Cool thing to, to watch and see the level of engagement and the passion around it. Um, we've brought in a consultant uh, to make sure that we do this right, right out of the gate and build the right foundation that's going to sustain us for many, many years to come. So she's started, uh, she's in her third month or so now. We'll have her till the end of March. Um, what we've been able to accomplish is we, you know, we now have a council. So there's 12 people within the organization. We have leaders within that council. We have it tied to a governance structure where myself and, and the, the regional president is the executive sponsors, and we connect, make that connection back to the executive committee up to the CEO. So there's this continuity of uh, constant sharing and the ability for this council to be successful because the executive committee, the CEO in particular, is connected and making these decisions with them. So it, it helps with speed of decision making and things uh, to that nature as well. Um, we have um, an ERG that formed uh, our black community of employees and um, we have and started a mentoring program with two underserved um, community schools in Philadelphia, public schools. One being a, uh, it's not considered um, designation STEM, but it is a science and engineering uh, high school. And then we also went into an elementary school, um, knowing and, and, and believing in the earlier you get these kids, the, the better success you will have in touching wow. as many lives as you possibly can. So we have um, that going where our intent is long-term, our, our vision is, is that bring, bring them through high school, help them get through high school, get them exposed as much as possible to every facet of STEM mm -hmm. and carry them uh, and, and um, follow them through college, give them scholarships as well. So we wanna Great. put some, some meat on the bones in terms of uh, our commitment. Uh, financially, and then uh, internships will be available to them and, and hiring them hopefully at the end of the day after college. So um, so there's that going on, but but I also found another non-for-profit organization that has found um, similar going into schools and, and being able to mentor uh, those those kids, but
but they found in their time in um, focusing on college readiness, they found that there's a population of, uh, of students that don't necessarily see that fit. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go to college or they don't think that that's the right choice for them, but that's, and that's okay. But they still may have interest in STEM. So how do we get those kids also on a path to success? Mm -hmm. So we might partner with that, that um, that's uh, organization as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Lots of changes. And then how would you say like the overall culture, like, you know, just having, you know, going, flipping the switch, like Dana said, and going overnight, you know, how has the leadership been able to really um, embrace that and, and help the employees along the way and yourself included? They, they've actually embraced it. The, the one, we have one executive in particular that was probably the strongest wow. um, against the whole remote work force. He was just very focused and, and found a lot of success in FaceTime. Um, he is our largest champion now. <laughs> too. Love that. Love that. Complete um, turnaround. It's, it's amazing. It is. It's, it's truly amazing. And, and we now will definitely have some type of hybrid as a result too, that we never probably would have been able to get off the ground as fast. Hmm. Um, hybrid type of remote working relationship with the employees. That's amazing. That's great. That's great. And then Pam, what do you see from your perspective? Because I know you do, you know, consulting with a lot of different businesses. How are some of those cultures changing and share about the diversity inclusion that you're seeing on that side as well and the culture shift? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the same things that Diane and Dana are talking about that they're driving or that they're seeing within their organizations. Um, certainly, if I were to pick words to describe um, or outcomes of 2020, it would be words like opportunity, innovation, flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, because I think um, 2020, for a variety of reasons, really allowed some organizations to leapfrog through a variety of different iterations to get them to the place where either leadership wanted them to be or whether employees wanted them to be, let's say mm -hmm. the flexibility to be able to work from home, um, whether that's full-time or more in a hybrid model. And so it just provided organizations with an opportunity to leapfrog over um, and to um, strip away a lot of the socialization conversations that you would normally have to have when you're trying to make that kind of a cultural change within the organization, because really organizations had no choice. Right. Um, and I do think it makes a difference, you know, both Diane and um, Dana talked about the fact that um, today there's some portion of their workforce that's actually going into the office because their jobs require that. Um, I think that will always be the case. And for some organizations, their entire workforce has been going to a workplace every day because they're essential workers and things like that. So I do see a difference um, in mind shift and in how organizations are thinking about some of these things based on both what their current work plan is in terms of we're completely virtual, we have a hybrid model of some sort, or we're completely still in the office. I think that has made a really big difference in terms of how organizations and leaders are thinking about some of the things that we're talking about on today's call. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'm seeing is that um, organizations, teams, leaders are needing to get really surgical um, and really, um, uh, really intentional about the things that they're doing and not just about what they're doing, but helping employees to understand why they're doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, some simple things, but I think things that make a huge difference in terms of culture and in terms of how people show up at work every day is at the beginning, I think there was this huge push that everything happened on Zoom or happened in some way face-to-face, -face, you know, using either Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever your organization's um, technology of choice were. I see organizations pulling back from that a little bit mm -hmm. um, and being really clear about some meetings don't need to be via Zoom. I can just mm -hmm. be on the phone with you because there's been so much Zoom fatigue. Definitely. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm working with a company right now and they actually started to make it mandatory that in the meeting invite, uh, whoever the meeting organizer is specify, there's the expectation that people will be on camera or no need for you to be on camera for this call. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm seeing people take more advantage, or at least when it was a little bit warmer here in Philadelphia, I'm taking a little bit more advantage of if it's just two people on a call, let's actually get outside and let's do yeah. a, let's do a virtual walk and talk. Yeah, that's like, great. If we don't have to see each other, we might as well be getting some exercise, some fresh <laughs> air. I don't have to be locked down to my computer. Right. 
you know, there's so much research coming out about Zoom fatigue and mm -hmm. that employees are actually working longer now that they're working yeah. from home because they're not necessarily accounting or they're, they're re reutilizing their commute time mm -hmm. and just getting, they're commuting from their kitchen to their living room. <laughs> um, and so yep. they're starting their day earlier. They're ending their day later. There's even less separation and division. Right. Um, and I think that's where I see leaders and the change in leaders with my organizations that I'm working with um, and where the HR teams and the executives are really working with their leaders to ensure that they're helping their employees to set the right kind of boundaries um, and understanding even more about the context of what's going on in somebody's personal life mm -hmm. so that between the organization and the employee, they can find the right flexible work situation um, that is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, that is great. Yeah, I mean, I just ordered myself a standing desk yesterday, you know, because yep. I found myself, I mean, I can't sit too long. Like I have to be up, I got to stand, I got to do something, I got to move. So, yep. you know, I think, you know, honing in on that, you know, we just can't just be sitting the whole time. We're not meant to be doing that the whole time. And we're we don't not. get up and walk to the water cooler and have those conversations. We're not walking down yep. the long halls, you know, like we used to, to see people. So it is definitely different. I love the idea of the walk and talk. I think that's great. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yep. I think Dana, Laura, yeah. just to piggyback on that, I think Dana mentioned, um, you know, that the physical safety of their employees has become even more paramount than it was you know, prior to this. Um, I see that across a lot of organizations in terms of organizations that sent hand sanitizer or face masks or things like that, but also some organizations that really early on said that our employees are the center of everything that we do and we need to be able to position them to be successful while they're working from home. So here, you know, organizations that gave allowances for people to go out at their home office to get the right desktop, whatever, yep. or sorry, the right lap um, desk, whatever they mm -hmm. needed. Um, I think all of those things are, um, are just for many companies are just iterations or the next evolution of the way they were already thinking about some of these things. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think that's great. I hear a lot of employees are getting the help that they need and that's the way it should be. You know, yep. you want to make them, you know, you want to set people up for success. So that's great. Thank you for sharing um, some of the ideas and what's happening in your organizations around the culture and the diversity and the councils. That's awesome. Laura, so I'm going to move. Yep. Could I just add two things? Yes, um, absolutely. Before, share. Yeah. Really for sure. the forward thinking. There's two things that, that I know IPS is, uh, is going to be embarking on is that's vaccinations. What do we do? With the vaccinations? Oh, vaccinations. Our, yeah. footprint, our real estate footprint is also oh. something that we're going to be working on. So between now and the end of the year, that's probably going to two big things that we're going to focus on this year around communication, yeah. making decisions. You know, some companies um, are considering um, they uh, are requiring it. Um, we're not. Right. Um, some are considering um, uh, incentivizing folks to take the vaccination. Mm -hmm. Not, but but some companies are. But these are the decisions that that also organizations are grappling with this year. Yeah. And the smaller footprint is, you know, what, what do we do with all this space now? Right. <laughs> and where is our leases coming? And and having to navigate all of that as well. And hoteling, you know, what what is the desk going to look like? It's going to look different. Um, mm -hmm. They come back to the office whenever that time might come. Yeah, they're, they're big changes that are going to come in 2021 for sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, the next question I had was, if you could share some light and shed some light on, you know, how your companies have changed around the teams part and the leadership management. And then Pam, you know, as you see trends um, in these areas among the businesses that you consult with on leadership management and team. So I'm gonna ask you to weigh in first and then Diane and Dana about the teams and the leadership and what changes have occurred um, within that area. Yeah, thanks, Laura. I think, uh, you know, I think it's sort of an extension of the earlier conversation we were having because it sure. all sort of bleeds together. Um, from, a, from, a, from a leadership perspective, I'm seeing that leaders really need to start to be um, even more thoughtful about how they're engaging with each one of their employees at a very um, personalized kind of level. Hmm. Um, and so again, going beyond when I get on a call with somebody saying, how are you? Because everybody will just answer fine to that. Um, getting really thoughtful about what questions do I want to ask my employees to really get to understand um, what's going on for them, what their motivation is, where they're struggling. That mm -hmm. struggle might be work-related. That struggle might be home-related. Right. And it's bleeding into what they're doing for work. Um, Definitely. But at the same time, um, leaders need to figure out a way to set up an environment that an employee trusts 
um, in their leader and trust yep. that they can have that vulnerable conversation. And so if you didn't have that kind of relationship with your employee before, when you saw them every day, there's an extra effort that you as a leader need to do or what I'm seeing and what I'm helping coach the leaders that I work with on is you need to figure out how to build up that trust with your employees so that they can be vulnerable with you and you guys can figure out how to make this be a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I've seen it at a higher leadership level also, and this goes to what um, Diane was just saying about office footprint, organizations rethinking what does it mean to have normal office hours? Right. Um, and so in certain organizations, like in a lab, it may or may not matter what time people are in doing their work. And so could we think about extending our office hours to accommodate people being in the office when they need to be, but also maximizing the safety of the people um, and also accommodating people's personal lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I have a spouse who has a job that's pretty rigid in terms of nine to five, but my job is more flexible, could I actually go work on a Saturday? And does it matter when my work, if, I'm, if my work is not um, tied to something critical in terms of hours in a day, does it actually matter where or when I'm, or sorry, not where, but when I'm getting my work done? Interesting. And so I think um, the conversations that we've been having or I've been having with some of the organizations that I work with is how do you get rid of the boundaries that we've always had? The traditional. Mm -hmm. Traditional. There's, you know, I don't know, because I didn't do the math before we got on the call, but there's seven <laughs> times 24 hours in a day where people right. could be working. You know, we traditionally have put these boundaries about what a weekend is. Mm -hmm. I think this is causing leaders and leadership teams to rethink and to sort of come up with whiteboard space ideas about mm -hmm. how work is gonna get done in the future. Yeah, the way in which we work is gonna be very different. Absolutely. Yeah. And your employees, you know, involving Dana and Diane both talked about involving their employees in the diversity conversation, but involving your employees in these kinds of conversations is also super critical. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to accommodate every request that everybody, that every employee has, but your employees, employees have great ideas about how they want to show up every single day and the mm -hmm. kind of work they want to do in that environment that they want to be in. They're at your disposal. You might as well tap into them and get get their insights and their ideas, you never know where something like that's going to lead. Yeah. And so I see more transparency in terms mm. of organizations asking their employees for input um, beyond the traditional employee engagement survey. Um, I see a lot more transparency in how leaders are communicating information and how often they're communicating it and not just communicating the decision, but the why behind the decision that was made to help employees get on board and to help bring employees along on the journey with them. That's great. I could, nice. And I, I could talk on forever about this topic, but I am clear that Dana and Diane also have some really good insights in this topic for their organization. So I'll stop there. Yep. Okay. Um, Diane, do you want to share some light, shed some light on that? Sure, sure. So uh, great points, really great points, Pam. And, and how Pam was focusing on breaking down those, breaking down those traditional barriers. Um, I, I wanna counter that point um, and, and complement that point by there's some boundaries that we actually need to create that we don't, didn't before, right? So there is that, that um, you know, breaking down, but, break and, but building up. And, and what I mean by that is we are so accessible to people's personal lives now, ever yeah. before. So we're seeing things and we're, and we're being part of things in some cases, a child walks in or, or there's a happy hour and a spouse joins or, you know, whatever it might be. And we, we have this, um, this, this, um, these guards that are starting to come down and these guards that you normally, if you're in an office setting, in a professional office setting, you have these norms of behaviors, right? That, that, that your standard, um, and that, that are very, um, uh, automatic, you know, you don't have to think about them. But now we're in this environment where we're, this access is some, in some cases maybe given us a, a sense of permission to behave a certain way or put down those guards that we not normally would have done or even think of doing before. And it's so subconscious, it could be so subconscious mm -hmm. that, that you don't know that those boundaries have been crossed. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of happy hours, you know, you're, you're, you're at home, you're, you're safe, you're not driving. So why not have a few more than you normally would in right. a <laughs> happy hour that, you know, we usually have a two ticket limit in our, in our, uh, in our company, right, um, right. <laughs> but at home, maybe not. So, you know, you're going to having this really fun conversation or you're putting games and the games get a little out of control. And, and again, it's, it's already out of control before you even realize it's out of control. So 
it's those, um, it's that awareness that, that we're going to ensure that our leaders understand those boundaries that need to actually be developed. Um, and another thing too is our global teams. We have found that in our leadership our, uh, and our teams globally, um, there's a sense of we're US, our, our global headquarters is in the US, but we're a global company. And we have found that our colleagues in Europe and Singapore and China and, and so on, that may have felt a little um, second thought in some cases. Like the or, stepchild or something. Or, yeah, they're feeling very empowered and, and very you know, in tuned with everything that's going on real time, like everybody else in the US. So it, it has leveled the playing field in a way hmm, that has yeah. been so refreshing and, um, and unexpected, I think, in a, in a lot of cases. And the last thing uh, I'll just compliment what Pam said is, is uh, as far as leadership development, there are skills that our leaders do not have today. And they didn't have to have necessarily. And that, that is around that, that level of empathy, the, the level of empathy. They've all had empathy to some degree, but the level's got to be deeper and, and more mm -hmm. um, overt than Definitely. maybe in the past. A sense of empowerment and trust that when your employees aren't in front of you, it's okay. Empower them and trust that they're going to get whatever they're going to get done within mm -hmm. the timeframe that works for them and that deeper level of empathy, understanding that they have kids running around them. Right, they right. Have a spouse that has to work outside the home, maybe, you know, or a dog that's barking, um, whatever it might be. Um, and, and that's not sometimes natural to a lot of our, our leaders. So we're going to be focusing on that this year too. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, and Dana, how do you maybe shed some light on the leadership and teams and what you're saying over at your company? Yeah, um, so a lot of you know, what Pam and Diane have mentioned, um, you know, I think the biggest change has been leading with em empathy and, mm -hmm. and providing flexibility. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen at Radian is that there's different mindsets with our management team. And we've recognized that as a leadership team and as an HR department, we needed to give managers the permission to allow for that flexibility and to make and empower them to make those decisions that made the most sense for their teams and the people on their teams. Hmm. Um, because there are some folks that are rule followers and, and they're kind of clung to, well, these are the rules that I know we had when we were in the office. So that's what I'm going to stick to. So you need to work from eight 30 to five o'clock. Um, and they were going to stick with those rules mm -hmm. because they didn't want to break the rules <clears throat> until somebody told them otherwise. Whereas others, you know, would kind of make the, the best decision for their team and they'd kind of ask for forgiveness later if, <laughs> if they needed to. Yep. Um, so it was, it was important for us as, as an HR team to, to give managers the permission and empower them mm -hmm. to lead with empathy and to have that and to figure out what works for each person on their team. Um, you know, like Pam and Diane had said earlier, what works for one person is not going right. to be what works for someone else. Right. Um, and especially in this scenario where, you know, you're probably working at home potentially with other individuals who are working at home, you yeah. potentially trying to homeschool children at the same time, which yeah. I don't know how working parents are doing that. Yeah. Um, so giving some people flexibility and it's okay if somebody needs a break in the middle of the day from 1130 to 130 so they could get their kids lunch and then come back online. Mm -hmm. Or if they need to start their day later because they need to get their kids set up on virtual learning yep. and then they just extend their day and log back on after dinner or whatever the case may be. Um, so we found that really kind of giving managers permission to use their own judgment and to trust their instincts and, and to provide that flexibility has really kind of helped to break down some of those um, boundaries that we kind of had in place previously. Um, the other thing that we'll continue to, to look at and make sure that we're providing tools and resources to our managers is what Diane mentioned, and people need to lead differently than they did before. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> some folks have been able to kind of make that shift on their own because it was more natural to them. And others are still kind of, well, if I don't see them every day, I don't know if they're working. Um, so mm -hmm. their reaction is, well, can I get software that tells me when people are logged in? <laughs> 
And we're trying to kind of shift away from that big brother. I need to um, see and touch to more focused on outcomes. Right. And, and how can we focus on what are the outcomes that people are delivering? What are the results that they're delivering for the organization? It doesn't matter how many hours of the day they worked or what hours they were, but are they getting their work done? Are they delivering the things that we need for the organization? Are they being mm-hmm. productive? Um, so we'll have a big focus on helping our managers and leaders make that shift to um, you know, really kind of measuring productivity and performance on outcomes versus, you know, some of the ways that, that leaders um, did in the past. Yeah, that's great. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask too, like around the third question about, you know, maybe, you know, let's talk about some light on your companies and how, you know, has the recruiting process even changed? And I don't even know that. So, you know, I don't know if things have really changed a lot in that area. And maybe Diane, if you want to jump in and talk about a little bit about the recruiting process and how has it changed or even if it has changed um, with your teams. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Laura. Yeah, it's, it's actually changed quite a bit. Um, recruiting has, for IPS, has been very regionally focused. So when we would look for talent, we'd try to get them as close as possible to the one of our offices, right? As, mm. as, as close as possible. But we have travelers as well, which were less, it was less important. Now, the, why, the net is so broad mm. now, it's, it's becoming less and less important How about that? where that person is, which is helping, tremendously yeah. helping. Our recruitment efforts to be able to pick somebody from Seattle to work on a project in Pennsylvania and, and that'd be okay. You don't have to physically be there necessarily. Um, things will change a little bit when we go back into the office and we get back into the routine a bit and it will be challenging for the organization, leadership, HR to be able to, to be able to still toe that line a bit and not go too far back to where we were because of the flexibility. The next generation coming up is going to expect right. that. Right, it's gonna be different. Be prepared, uh, which we weren't. Um, right, generally speaking, as an industry, um, no one really was prepared for that next generation. We were still kind of stuck in that mid to to later in career folks, and mm-hmm. um, but but geography is not going to be a huge barrier for us anymore. Is, is the one? Yeah, thing. yeah. Diversity, the walls are down. Mm-hmm. Diversity is uh, is a huge focus for us now. Um, again, case, case uh, our case for change. Uh, is present and it is helping us uh, drive relationships with um, organizations like NSBE, our, our National Black uh, Engineer Society uh, Association, mm-hmm. um, our HBCUs, uh, our historical Black um, colleges and universities, um, and being able to tap into those resources and, and diversify our thought process, diverse, bringing people into the organization that's going to diversify how we think decisions we make and it's not about a quota or it's not about um, how many women versus African-Americans you have. It's who do you want to see in your organization is going to challenge your thought. Mm-hmm. And sitting at around a table, challenging our leaders to think and ask themselves on a frequent basis, who's missing mm-hmm. at this table? And, and that's, that's going to take time. Um, but through the people that we bring in the organization, they're going to bring in similar people to themselves. And then it's just going to, it's going to spiral. It'll, happen. It'll, it'll take yeah. less and less effort over time. Yeah, the um, snowball effect. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And in terms of training, um, video conferencing, being have, having access to that kind of stuff too, that might be a little later in your, in your questioning. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. No, okay, get share it. Uh-huh. Um, but video conferencing uh, is, is the access to self-driven learning. Mm-hmm. It's so much more plentiful now than it, than it was a year ago. There, yeah. there was so much reliance on what's a company going to do for me and how are they going to structure this training for me to be able to register and, and sign up versus a, a push type of strategy I'm seeing with, with a lot of training curriculum content companies versus a pull where they mm-hmm. shout contact now, content as m- more often now, people then self-driving their careers and their own developments in the luxury and the flexibility of their own schedule at home. Mm-hmm. Just having to have a certain time frame in order to to develop themselves. Yeah, they're so much more open to them. That's great. That's great. And then um, Dana, do you want to share about some of the recruiting and processing and how that's looking in the training on your company and what you're seeing? Sure. In the past years, uh, year and how it's changed. Yep. Yeah, we um, we experienced something similar in that it really 
being a remote um, and and having a leadership team that's open to allowing people to work throughout the U.S. even after our, it's safe to reopen our offices, um, mm-hmm. it really opened up a national talent pool for us. Yeah. Um, so we also used to previously kind of recruit around the geographic areas where we had offices, um, ex- except for certain positions. Our mm-hmm. underwriting positions are typically virtual and they're anywhere and, and things like that. Um, but it enabled us to, to open up the talent pool for some of the high demand roles that we have in technology, data science, um, information security, which is a really um, hot field right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it allowed us to, to connect with candidates and talent pools that we didn't before um, and, and really focus on you know, bringing in the most talented employees to the organization. Um, it was interesting in that initially we had some leaders that were resistant to hiring folks, having only communicated them with them through Zoom. Um, so that was something that was, you know, it seems so long ago at this point. Um, but I remember one of our sales leaders had um, had an opening and he was reluctant to, to pull the trigger on making an offer until he's like, you know, I had, he's a sales guy. He's like, I need to sit across the table from this person and shake their hand and, you know, look them in the eye and this, that, and the other. And um, so it, we did see that in some instances, it took a little time to get mm-hmm. folks used to um, the fact that they couldn't wait forever. <laughs> while it's different. Think, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, I guess the other thing that we learned is, is how are we assimilating people differently once they do join? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. So our town. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I had a, an HR intern over the summer that was virtual, which was mm-hmm. great because she was a huge lift to some of the inclusion and diversity work that we were doing. Um, but I realized very quickly that I was the only person she was communicating with <laughs> because I was the one that was working with her. And, you mm-hmm. know, and she and I were working closely and I'm like, I need to get her talking to other people because she's missing out on that whole experience right. of learning what everyone else in the department does. So, um, so being a little more intentional on in how we are making those connections for employees, not only with the people that they work with on a day-to-day basis, but getting them connected with people from other cross-functional teams and, and from other departments. So our talent acquisition leader has, has done a lot of work on our onboarding process. Um, our leadership team is doing a rotation now on a monthly basis to, to welcome employees oh. um, through like a virtual coffee break, That's great. Um, which is great because they can do it over Zoom and it doesn't matter what location you're in. So it's really kind of opened up the, the capabilities there and, and the ideas. Um, so we're trying to, to do some new and creative things to make sure that people feel part of the organization when they join us. Right. Right. Yeah. And then um, Diane, do you want to weigh on in that on your company too, with the onboarding process, if that's changed for you? And then I'll have Pam share what she's been saying in her organizations. Yes. Yes. We have changed our onboarding quite a bit. Um, on a dime, we had to go <laughs> right to virtual, which was, we were flying people in. Um, wow. We were very FaceTime oriented with our Wow. Travel uh, expenses down. Yes, yes. <laughs> more, more for your employees development, right? Well, budget, yes. Um, but yeah, it was, um, so, so we had to flip that uh, switch really fast. I have an amazing onboarding um, professional on, on my HR team that um, just on a time was able to adapt wow. and adjust. Um, one thing that we did similar to Dana's is our regional president. Um, this is the idea of, of this, this uh, my, uh, one of the HR folks that, that manages the onboarding. Um, she uh, was w- requested the uh, president to chime in to, to join the orientation at a certain time. So it was very able, he was able to manage his, his calendar. So he makes it every single Monday. We do orientations every Monday. That's great. Uh, once a week. And um, it's gone so far. The new employees are so wowed by being able to interact, not just seeing him introduce himself, but he, he chats with them and asks oh, them about great. themselves. And they feel so much more welcome. And then once mm-hmm. they um, get through the, the general orientation, there's an integration uh, at the department level. 
um, but again, virtually. So everything that, I guess the biggest difference too, in terms of um, more rigor is planning. There's so much more planning, IT getting the laptops to them. You know, right. Right. Oh yeah. And in the beginning of the pandemic, Dell, I don't know, Dana, if you're experiencing this, but Dell was so overwhelmed because every right. company now was giving yep. everybody a laptop. We had all this backlog. So there were people starting and a couple of weeks into their start, they, they didn't, they weren't able to log in. Equipment, so right. It. Yeah, it was, um, so lots of adjustments from a technology process and, um, and structure. Yeah, that's great. And then Pam, how about on your side with the recruiting and the onboarding and training piece? What what are you saying? Yeah, so lots of some lots of similarities, and I'm guessing lots of similarities for others that are on the call as well, um, in terms of how people needed to flip on a dime for some things, um, and getting people comfortable with hiring somebody that I've actually never met, like I've never met in person, but I'm going to entrust this person to go do whatever this job is. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, uh, both Dana and Diane mentioned, it allows them to cast a wider net on who their candidates are. Um, what I'm seeing is that at the beginning, that it became almost a pendulum swing of we only recruit geographically. Now we, now we can recruit any place in the world, mm -hmm. theoretically. Um, and what I'm seeing with my clients is it's coming somewhere into the middle. And so they're getting much more specific about which jobs does that make sense for, or which roles does that make sense for? And which roles actually do we still need because it makes sense for the job for somebody to be geographically located or because eventually we know this role at least part of the time is gonna to need to be in the office. And so getting much more um, intentional about mm -hmm. it's not one or the other, but again, we're gonna be really intentional about having a hybrid model about how we think about that. I think the really important thing for that is being really clear about your why around the decisions that you're making so that people who are currently in your organization and people that you're bringing into the organization understand that there's some equity about how we're thinking about this. Um, and it's not person to person. It, we're very specific about the roles or the jobs. Um, and we're applying whatever those guidelines are or whatever those design principles are, we're applying those consistently across the board um, so that people believe that those decisions are fair so when somebody sitting who has to be in the office every day is sitting next to somebody who doesn't have to be in the office every day, they understand the reason that those decisions were made. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, again, I just think a lot more um, intentionality around the decisions that are being made and why those decisions are being made. Um, the other thing that I'm starting to see um, and uh, that I know from a past life is super important is not everybody loves working from home. For not not everybody is their most productive. Dana's raising mm -hmm. it, right. I'm also I like working from home, but if I had my druthers, I would go to a client site three days out of five because um, I get a lot of my social interaction needs met. In yeah, the yeah. Um, for some people, and there's a different way that you think about the work, and there's a different way that you go about structuring your day and about the work, and not everybody has that skill or capability, nor does everybody want to build that up. And right. so I'm seeing that for the roles that organizations believe can be done virtually 100% of the time, you're needing, they're needing to rethink the kinds of interview questions that they're asking. Right. Get to, is this a candidate that can work well in this situation and be successful or mm -hmm. not? Because not everybody can be and mm -hmm. not everybody wants to be. And so yeah. It's as much yep. about thinking about the role and where that role needs to be located, but also are we asking the right questions of the candidates to make sure that we're making a good fit, both for us as an organization, but also for the can is the candidate making a good fit based or a good decision based on what they know. And so how you think about assessing candidates, I think changes slightly, depending upon what your mind frame is or what your um, what your thinking is about where roles are going to be located. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to say, which um, Diane touched on and Dana did as well, is just how do you onboard people who have never been in an office? Right. How do you help them understand sort of what the, when you're in the office, you get to see the posters or you get to see the client stories or you get to see the, like, we have snacks and that's a part <laughs> of our culture. And it's a silly part of our culture, but it still says something about the culture. And so how do you translate those things that are kind of intangible when everybody's together to when everybody's not together. And so I've seen, in addition to some of the things that Diane mentioned, um, in terms of having seen their leaders show up and onboarding, you know, their weekly onboardings, um, right. people have gotten way more creative about what's going into a welcome packet. So mm -hmm. 
-hmm. as an example, am I just getting a box with a laptop with no instructions whatsoever? <laughs> or is there, or is there some thought that went into there's a laptop, there's all of my cords, there's a welcome note from my IT person. There's some set of instructions that is a really huge difference in terms of the, yeah. um, the new employees experience with the organization. Right. And again, says something about your culture. Um, uh, and, and it's, so much more time consuming, as Diane mentioned, to do these things when people are virtual than when they're sitting in an office. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that you're also allowing the space for your employees who are currently doing that kind of work, your onboarding manager, your IT people, giving them a little bit more space to be able to do this in a thoughtful manner um, is what I'm seeing. I see a whole new business brewing. Welcome kits for onboarding employees. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Ab absolutely. absolutely. Yep. There it goes. Yep. I'm ignoring you. Yeah, there it yep. goes. Can I offer one example to compliment something? Um, and support yeah, for it? sure. Yeah. Pam was mentioning how, um, you know, some roles might be okay long-term after right. uh, COVID remote and some may not. And, and I just want to give an example where I got it wrong. I had a payroll person and you'd think payroll, oh, you definitely need that person close to the office as much as possible is, or in the office because it's such a critical part of, you know, people have to get paid, right? So I, uh, she was, she wanted to relocate, she decided to relocate her family on a, for personal reasons down to Florida and we're in Pennsylvania and, and she would do international payroll as well, but, but primarily the U.S. and, and the decision, I made a decision that, oh, you know, that's just, that role doesn't seem to fit. Well, fast forward a couple months, she's doing great. Absolutely. <laughs> There's absolutely no problem with her um, doing this remotely. We've had no issues whatsoever. So, um, so it's just interesting. And, and if there's HR folks on, on the line that, that are going to have these conversations with their leaders, after you, you may define or, or identify what those roles are, then go back and maybe test it out and see if maybe that original or initial decision was the right one, because I, I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's great, great. And then um, before we turn it over to some questions, because we have some questions in the chat, um, I just want to, in closing, thank you all for participating. And in closing, if you could each share maybe your aha moment of 2020, and um, maybe Dana, if you want to go first and share that, that would be great. And then I'll have sure. Pam and then Diane. That's great. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, <clears throat> shamelessly borrow a quote <laughs> that um, one of my colleagues um, utilized as we're thinking about our future work design and, and what do we need to look like and what roles could be remote, you know, long term. Um, but there's a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Um, that says, a mind that is stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions. So I think True. the aha moment for us is that we need to evolve and take advantage of the opportunity and the experience that we've had in order to think about doing things differently. Um, yeah. We've talked about this in, in variations throughout the discussion, but the expectation that our employees now have of their employer is different. Yeah. And and the expectation that employers have of their employees is now different. So, so that value proposition and that informal handshake between the employee and the, the employer has evolved. So w that was kind of our big aha moment, or I would, I'll say my aha moment, and that our HR team is, is now trying to focus on, okay, so how has that handshake changed? Um, and how do we need to make sure that we're meeting the expectations of our employees and that they understand what the company is going to, to do for them and how the company will invest in them and what the company expects back from them as well. Um, you know, Pam mentioned that kind of self-directed learning and, and mm -hmm. having the ability to that. So we'll make those tools available, but we need you to take advantage of them and take the initiative and own your own careers and things like that. Um, so we're kicking off some work um, at Radian um, around our employee value proposition and refining that and um, kind of being making sure that we can tell the current story in terms of what what our employees can expect from us and what we expect back from them and and um, and engage external um, prospective employees as well. Um, so that that's my great. takeaway. That's great. Thank you. And then Pam. 
Um, your then, aha moment. <laughs> well, it's hard to pick one. There were so, so, <laughs> there so, were so many, many, right? many, many for in sure. 2020 for sure. And they're just continuing into 2020. Uh, they are. Mm-hmm. I feel like people had this, myself included, this unrealistic expectation the calendar was going to flip and something magically was going to change <laughs> yeah. on January the 1st. And then January 1st got here and we're like, oh, that's more of the same. Huh? The same, right? right. Um, yeah, I think um, sort of building on what Dana was saying, I think my biggest aha, and it, it was more of a, uh, I think my biggest aha was that if you give people the space to stand up and do the right thing and do the things that you want them to do, but give them the space and the empowerment to do that, they will do that. Um, and so I think we tend to underestimate sometimes the power mm-hmm. of the people that we have working around us um, to, to just shine and to demonstrate their potential on a daily basis. Um, and this, the situation that happened in 2020 sort of forced organizations to be able to do that with their people. And so if you put people in impossible situations, they will show up and do the most impossible, but most amazing things. That's great. Thank you. And then Diane, your aha moment. My aha moment. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about global teams. Actually, my aha moment has been around how uh, powerful and as a silver lining to this COVID and, and, and something that we're going to mm-hmm. want to continue to do is create more connectivity. Let's continue to use t- Teams to some degree post COVID um, because the the one, um, there was a situation with, uh, I have a global team and, and we would meet in team meetings on the phone, not in, in person, but uh, when, when they were uh, remote in other countries, um, but in just that team for that region. And now we've expanded since COVID and uh, being able to, to scale uh, as fast as we can, I would then pull in all the regions and have these, now we, we can see each other <laughs> on a camera yeah. and it's not just on a call. And um, I want this person and this team to learn from this team and, and understand what each other's doing. We may not have any crossroads um, necessarily, but it's important and, and a way to, again, planning and, and be forward thinking and be more deliberate. I wanted, a community. I wanted to, to develop a community. And one of the employees in, in my Europe, I'll never forget it. She says to me, I always felt, I never want to say anything to you, Diane, but I never felt like a, a real strong connection to the U.S. team because we're, we're U.S. based, our global headquarters is in the U.S. So a lot of the activity comes from the U.S. And she um, sometimes always felt like an afterthought or that she didn't know a lot of times what was going on with the U.S. team. She goes, but since in these last eight months, I have never felt more connected to all of you in such Amazing. a powerful way. So I want to foster that. That's my aha. I want to, I, I don't want that to go away. I, I want to continue that. And it's such a blessing from such a tragedy. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And it's interesting that, you know, even though we've all been thrown into our homes, it seems like we've all become closer or networked or weaved intentionally, you know, we've been doing this and making our closer connections, even though we've been so far apart. And that's the beauty of the resilience. And that's, it's really been great to see. So thank you so much, everyone, for sharing um, your thoughts and your insights and what your businesses are doing. Really appreciate that. And we love Rocky. He can come into the video anytime, <laughs> Dana. That is of, of course, I almost made it through the whole Zoom. No, 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 I wasn't letting you go. That's fine. I have some questions here. So I'm just going to look in the chat. I have a few. I'll go through those. And then um, I can ask, does anyone have any recommendations on how to better recruit diversity candidates for any of the panel, if they want to jump in? That was a question from Shan, Sharon. Um, one of the things that our um, town acquisition team has done is they've done a scrub of our job descriptions to try to have more gender, gender neutral role, um, dis, um, mm-hmm. words throughout the job description so that it doesn't in a potentially an unconscious way, someone reading the description feels like I don't see myself in that role. Um, so that's one thing that our, our recruitment team has done. Um, they've done a great job with trying to just make sure that our job descriptions were, were, were written in such a way that <clears throat> all candidates could picture themselves in that role and doing that work. Um, the other thing that they've done is we've made sure to ask questions of people that were applying for leadership roles and behavioral based questions around what is it that they've done to foster inclusion and diversity in their past experiences. And 
doing that in a way to make sure that they, A, that it's showing that it's important for us and that we expect this from our leaders, um, but also giving them an opportunity to, to kind of share with us, you know, what, they, what they've done in that regard so that um, we can continue to kind of weave that into the organization. Um, so those are there are two things that our recruitment team has done that I think have helped um, with engaging and attracting candidates, um, you know, from all backgrounds. That's great. And then Diane, on your end, is there anything you want to um, add? The, the, yeah, the, the biggest thing that we found initially was access. How mm -hmm. do we create more channels of access to candidates, diversity candidates? Um, so NSBE, uh, National uh, Black Society for uh, Engineers, Engineering Society, um, we, we joined that group. We um, uh, HBCUs or historical black universities. We now have um, identified the top 10 in the nation. So every posting that goes through, will go through those channels and help with our net, broadening our net and, and um, being more specific with our net and who we're pulling in and not just those that look, for, look like us. And we're a consulting company, so a lot of uh, the employee or candidates that were being brought in were being brought in by referrals or by some type of network relationship, whether it was a direct referral or not, but someone's Joe knew Sue and Sue knew Mark and, mm -hmm. so on, and, and they learned about IPS. Um, so when you do that, you, you are going to network and, and naturally have relationships with most people that look like you, that think like you. That, um, that are in the same uh, circles as you. So we're breaking out of that, creating those, those different channels. Mm -hmm. And then Pam, is there any that you wanna add in that you've seen to be um, able to recruit better diversity candidates? Yeah, so uh, the tip that Dana gave about leveraging some kind of a tool or a platform to be able to scrub your job descriptions to get rid of biased language, that's, mm -hmm. that's a pretty easy, pretty low ticket to entry to do. And I've seen great success with that. Um, but the other thing um, that I advise my clients when they talk about, we want a more diverse set of candidates, let's get really specific about what does that mean? Like mm -hmm. what kind of diversity are we looking to attract? Because that will drive your strategy about where and how you go um, go about identifying uh, the target or that population that you're looking for. It's the, attracting diverse talents is not a one, um, it's not a one source kind of thing there. You need separate strategies depending upon what you're trying to, um, who you're trying to identify. Um, mm -hmm. And going to something that Diane said earlier, which I think is a way harder thing to do than meeting a metric around, we have this many women in our organization, this many people of color in our organization, which is diversity of thought. Um, and so really being, and um, this is where I think talent acquisition teams and talent management and the HR business partners and business leaders need to work together, which is actually, what are we missing in our team today? Either from an experience perspective, from a skill set perspective, from a diverse, you know, from a thought perspective, what are we missing today? And when we go to hire the next candidate into that team, how do we hire for those things that we're missing? So we have a really well-rounded, diverse team. That is a much more complicated, much more nuanced conversation than we need to hire, you know, seven women in an engineering department to make sure that we're balanced. Right. Um, so, right. um, yeah, so, but I think you need to be specific about what you're looking to attract or who you're looking to attract and build your strategy around that. Yep. Thank you, Pam. We have just five more minutes left. And I have one more question here that I'm going to ask the panel. Thank you for sharing in the chat. And it's, you know, what kind of challenges in training the new hires do you see? Dana, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the biggest thing that we realized is that we couldn't just rely on chair side and, right. and <laughs> those types of things. Um, so there's been a lot more emphasis on preparation prior to right. someone joining, um, making sure that you can let them know where certain things are, making it easy for them to engage, you know, setting up their schedule. Like I had shared my experience earlier, realizing that my poor intern was only talking to right. me and that she needed to talk to more people, um, being more intentional with their schedule and their calendar and things like that. Um, our, our training team, we have some positions that go straight into a training program that's okay. you know, a, a couple weeks um, and they shifted to virtually. Um, they went through some ups and downs and kinks that they worked through. Um, but for the areas that were not um, 
that were onboarding folks that didn't have a structured training program. Um, we had to help our managers with being more intentional. And, and from an HR perspective, it was really our job to help them kind of ask, think through it. So we're asking them the questions of what are the things that they need to do? Need, right. How are they going to need to, how are they going to know where to go to, to get certain things? Do they have a, like, we've done a lot with kind of buddying people up to say, this is, if you feel like you have, that's great. What you may think is a stupid question. <laughs> There's no stupid question. So yes, here's your person, person right. to ask. <laughs> right. Um, great. So mm -hmm. um, we found that those things helped uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah. But that's it took great. us a while. Yeah. How about you, Diane, the new hire training? Yeah. So, so in, in carrying what they're learning in the, the general orientation, carrying that into their um, department's division yeah. right. um, has been challenging. Um, them feeling a sense of belonging um, has been a strain, you know, them, them um, I, I feel terrible for anybody that has started a new job during this COVID. Yeah. It, is, it is so difficult to know, not only just um, having that real time moment of on the job training that you, you just can't duplicate um, in the remote mm -hmm. world, but just the knowing who to go to. So mm -hmm. we're, we're we're aspiring to be better at, uh, we have an office buddy type of setting uh, of structure right. right now. So there is one person that they're, they are connected to that's not their supervisor. That's um, great. Beyond that, you know, how, how do you build out that network a little bit wider? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Pam, what are you seeing on the trends on your end for the new hires? Really similar things. Awesome. Uh, okay. it, again, it depends on the role. Um, I have a few clients, Dana, that are in the situation where you described where new hires were going through a, a pretty formalized process anyway. Um, for all of them, actually, they were in the process of figuring out how to make it virtual so they could cast that wider net for those types of roles. So they weren't starting completely from scratch, but it, again, like allowed them to leapfrog. Um, and for some of them, they actually got way more resources from a technology and a spend perspective because now the organization had no choice but to train people this way. Um, so for the training teams and the learning and development teams, it was actually like a windfall for them because um, they got to do things that they'd been wanting to do for a few years now. Um, uh, I think the hiring manager and the person's manager just needs to step up and play a way bigger role in right. making sure that the employees are getting what they need, which quite frankly, they should have been doing all the way along, but HR right. and others <laughs> enable them not to do that. Um, speaking I've done that myself as an HR person. Um, but I think, again, it goes back to lead, the leadership expectations that we have for our leaders are changing. And this is an area where they're, they just need to take on a ton more responsibility to make sure that their new employees are getting what they need. That's great. Thank you so much. So we're at the one o'clock and I wanna thank Pam and uh, Dana and Diane for weighing in and sharing with me and the, our people that are here and sharing with us about their organizations and how they've been able to change and adapt and really thrive through this uh, turbulent time. So thank you so much. Thanks ladies Thanks for having us. Thank you. Have a great afternoon and bye thank bye. you. This will be recorded and uh, it'll be on our website. Our next event is February 18th and that'll be a noon event with our new panel and it's really all about adapting. So thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. You too. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Bye, Dina.